Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, and a healthy good morning from the annual meeting of New Champions 2015 in Dalian, China. And uh, thank you for, for joining us here in the room and uh, on the live stream and on YouTube. Um, you're joining the briefing session on the latest breakthrough innovation in health. And uh, the, the British singer Adele, she, she sings in one of her songs, We Could Have Had It All. And I have to say, we are very close to that, having it all, because we have a wonderful panel today from our Technology Pioneers community. Um, and the people joining, joining us here today, they're entrepreneurs, they're researchers, they're innovators, and they're health experts. So we're very close to, to having it all. And allow me the note, we also have a very nice gender balance on the panel, which is uh, something we're sometimes struggling with. So I'm, <laughs> so I'm very happy uh, to, to present that panel to you. Um, right to my immediate left is Fulvia Montresor. She is the head of the technology pioneers community at the World Economic Forum. Next to her is Ron Goodman, who's the founder and chief executive uh, officer of Health Tap. Further down the line, uh, we're joined by uh, Catherine Boffley, who is the chief executive officer of Editus Medicine. And last but definitely not least, uh, we're joined today by Nina Tandon, who's the president and chief executive officer of Epibone. And um, without further ado, Fulvia, let me hand over to you. And um, why don't you give our audience a bit of background? Who are the technology pioneers? And um, what role are they playing here at the annual meeting of new champions? Thank you. Sure. So technology pioneers are a community at the forum that are made up of early stage companies that are all involved in designing, developing, and deploying new cutting edge technologies. And we expect them all to have a very big impact on society and industry. So just as sort of an example, you know, past tech pioneers have included companies like Bloom Energy, Bluebird Bio, Google, Twitter, and Nest. So some household names. Um, and they really come from all sectors. So everything from alternative energy sources to artificial intelligence, robotics, uh, digital security. I could go on and on. Uh, in terms of their role at the annual meeting of new champions, it's really um, being able to help provide all of those insights on which technologies are going to change our industries, change our society, and to uh, use the opportunity of having public and private cooperation here to help grapple with all of the challenges of bringing these, society, these technologies to market. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Now, um, we obviously want to hear more, more about you, and, and Catherine, I start with you because uh, I know you received a large investment uh, recently, congratulations for that. So let's say you, you're meeting an investor, in two, th two to three minutes, what's your elevator pitch? How, wh what are you telling him? What are you doing and what is the impact of, what will the impact of your company be? Well, the most fundamental idea is what if you could repair broken genes? Editas Medicine is a biotechnology company that focuses on genome editing. And the technology, the name of the technology, some of you may have read about called CRISPR-Cas9, which is a very jargony description, as often scientific names are. But the fundamental idea is, what if you could repair broken genes? We've known for a long time that a mutation in a gene or a mistake in the DNA can lead to a disease. Those are often some of the most difficult diseases to create medicines for, diseases like cystic fibrosis or Huntington's disease, uh, ALS, amyotrophic uh, lateral sclerosis. And the list goes on. There are over 5,000 genetically driven diseases. And then also beyond those diseases, we know that genetics do play a very significant role in, in many other diseases. And so we've known for a long time if we could repair the gene at the level of the DNA, that would be a very compelling way to potentially address those kinds of genetically driven diseases. But we haven't had good tools to do that. And that's where this genome editing technology comes in, is a precise and specific way to be able to correct the DNA at the level of the gene. Still a lot of technical challenges to really turn that into medicines, but this, this young but very exciting and powerful science that's come out of academia in these past few years has, we've begun to translate that. That's what we're doing at Editas, is to translate that into medicines for a wide variety of these diseases. Thank you very much. Nina, over to you. What's, what's your elevator pitch? How are you telling people about your company? What are you doing and what's the impact? Yeah, well, many people don't realize that after blood, uh, bone is the most transplanted human tissue. 
And quite literally, the only way even now to get human bone is to cut it out of a human. And um, needless to say, this is, um, there's no piece of bone that's um, not necessary. And, um, and so what we propose to do is actually something a little bit different, is to, is to take the cells that grow our bones in our bodies every day and to utilize those in the laboratory to grow new bones that can then be used to repair the body. Thank you. Ron, what, uh, what does your company do and, and what's the impact? How do, you, how do you explain to people what you're doing? Absolutely. So, you know, it's all about uh, world-class healthcare, democratized, now. Uh, we're basically uh, building a, a global health practice, uh, a place where you can actually access some of the best physicians in the world anytime, anywhere, from any mobile device or web connection. We have more than 72,000 physicians in our network. You can access them by text, by video, or by voice, 24-7. These are some of the best physicians in the world. You can ask them any health question. You can get answers in minutes or in seconds. You can actually get tips from them about how to manage your health and well-being. You can read what news they recommend, what health news they think are medically sound. You can see reviews that they uh, provide on medical apps and also even on medications. So they share their opinions and actually we serve more than 3.5 billion doctor answers and tips to date to people all over the world. We're growing in the US, but we also are growing very rapidly internationally right now. And we provide our services either direct to consumers, so you can just download our app, our HealthTap app on, on Apple or Android phones, or you can go online to healthup.com and just go and access all this wealth of medical information for free in minutes, and the immediacy of the information is what makes us unique. There are no delays, there are no waiting rooms. You can actually either engage with this content for free and just learn about your health and even ask these doctors questions about yourself and get answers in minutes, or you can subscribe to our premium services and pay a subscription fee and then get immediate access on an ongoing basis to these doctors from any mobile device or web connection. You can either buy it yourself or have your insurance company or your employer buy it for you because we're working with enterprise now. And as of recently, we actually started working also with hospital systems and we provide our platform as a service to hospitals all over the world to provide virtual care to their own patients with their own doctors. So it's either provided by our network of 72,000 US licensed physicians or by the doctors of the hospitals that license our software. Thank you, Ron. And I have to say, I'm, I'm very happy that I'm not competing for funding with the three of you. Um, <laughs> uh, very impressive. Fulvia, back to you. Um, let's pretend it's just the two of us in the room and nobody's watching. Um, why did you choose these three companies for your, for your community? Let me put you on the spot. <laughs> I, I think all three of them are just doing um, such unique um, unique, amazing things, but the, the scope of impact of each of them, as they've described in their own words, much more effectively than I can, is going to be huge. It really is going to change the way that we deal with diseases, that we deal with daily health care, that we deal with you know, accidents and requirements for, for new bones. Um, so all of these are really meet our requirements of technology pioneers, true amazing innovations that will have huge impact. Thank you, thank you. Um, we've been discussing earlier today about the, the challenges that, uh, that the three companies are facing. So um, would, you, would you share with us, uh, and Nina, I'll start with you this time. Sure. Uh, what, what is the biggest challenge you're facing? And keep in mind, the forum is a multi-stakeholder organization, so you have all these CEOs and regulators here. So make this your wish list. Uh, a, what's the challenge? And what would you tell the people here uh, and say, come on, you can do that uh, for me to help me? Right, so, so we're, EpiBone is actually based in the United States, so um, I, I, don't, I can't comment, well, my comments are mostly um, about the US, although I think that um, it really does encapsulate kind of the world view um, from a regulatory perspective on um, cell therapies. So, so essentially with EpiBone, we have a therapy that's um, where some of the material that goes into the therapy is derived from the patient themselves. And so this, this represents a shift in how medicine has been developed and then therefore how it, it, it implies that there are going to be changes with how that kind of therapy will, will go through clinical trials. 
The idea of a double-blinded study is impossible to do if you have um, a person who's providing <laughs> the ingredients for a therapy. Um, in addition, um, there, it's, it's very difficult to, to think of what a healthy control is. Um, you know, there's no analog in the cell therapy world for take an, an aspirin if you don't have a headache. Um, and so when we think about r where we are now, we're, we're testing in large animals. We've um, implanted 30 pigs to date with um, new bones in their, in their face. And we've seen really good results. And we're thinking, how do we, how do we map the results we've seen towards clinical trials? And this does present a challenge. The good news is, is that um, the, the regulators are scientists themselves and have been very gracious with us in terms of um, you know, having a dialogue. In fact, they reached out to us at conferences to, to try and help us think about clinical trials. But there are, there are many challenges. Um, think map, you know, concepts that sound very simple, things like dose. <laughs> very hard to define when you say, okay, well, cell therapy, what does a dose mean? And, and maybe it could mean the number of cells that are infused in a bone before engineering it. Maybe it could be the amount of time that we mature the bone before it gets implanted into a person. Um, how do you map concepts like pharmaco, um, kinetics to, to a therapy that remains in the body. So there are many challenges that abound, um, but the good news is, is that we're in the United States, which is um, a place that is a, a large market. Um, in fact, it is the largest single market. And, and is, it seems to be that the mood um, is, is one of collaboration. Um, so this is very heartening to us. Nonetheless, you know, we're, we're scientists and we're, 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 not, um, we're not business people. We're, we're training ourselves as we go along and, and, ga and gathering the help of experts. But we, we are worried, you know, are we going to make a mistake at this early stage? You know, if, as we're moving to meet, um, serum free media, right? We're moving to serum free media as we're growing um, bones. The serum free media that we're using, we're trying to make sure that we're using the same exact ingredients that we will use in people. Okay, this is for very good reasons, but has after effects like, oh, maybe that cell free media, that, that serum free media is not optimized for pig cells. Maybe it's optimized for human cells. Mm. And so are we going to sabotage our results because we're, for example, you know, trying to mimic our process as best we can for very good regulatory reasons, but having a nice side dish of, of difficulty with um, extrapolating the results. So, so this is just a sampling of some of the, of the issues that I think come up with cell therapies, but I really think the good news is, is that everyone's excited about the potential of regenerative medicine. Everyone understands the impact that having, you know, with fewer surgical revision surgeries that are necessary, having implants that last as long as we do. Um, and so I think that the mood is one of collaboration to try and tackle these issues together. But that's just a sampling of what we're, what we're up against at the moment. <laughs> Thank you. Catherine, uh, what do you want to add? What's your perspective on this? Well, it's interesting because hearing Nina talk about her challenges, I, I'm nodding and I'm thinking, yes, I know exactly <laughs> what you're talking about. And I, and I realize for a lot of folks who aren't in that deep detail of developing new medicines, it, it, some of the challenges seem a bit arcane, very technical. Um, but how do you test appropriately with scientific rigor, with taking into account all the appropriate ethical considerations when you're doing something that's a, a potentially permanent change like the, the kind of bone approach you're taking or what we're doing in terms of editing genes. Yeah. You do have to test these to make sure they actually are working appropriately and are they safe enough. But the, the ways that we test other medicines, we can learn some lessons, but we're gonna have to really invent new ways to appropriately mm -hmm. test those. And I think you, you mentioned the regulatory authorities, the FDA, the EMA, the authorities in all the different countries where you want to do your work will be taking that journey with us. I think they yeah. tend to be quite science driven, which is which is what we all want as consumers as well. Um, and we will all be working to find the right way to test these new medicines and these new therapeutic approaches to figure out if they are doing what we hypothesize and hope that they will do. Um, beyond that, all the normal challenges of building a company. Finding the right people, finding the right capital, figuring out your plan. <laughs> we can go on and on forever, but this is where I suspect that you have a lot of familiar <laughs> challenges as well along these lines. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, uh, after uh, hiring 72,000 physicians into our network, uh, I can say that, you know, bringing physicians on board to engage uh, and to, to do things with us, you know, initially for, you know, we paid nothing, but they still helped us serve more than 3.5 uh, billion doctor answers. 
uh, bringing the best and top talent is very important, right? And, and in medicine and in engineering, uh, which are the two areas where we spend most of our time in, these are some of the most challenging hires to make. Uh, and I think that we focus on top, top talent only because people, when they access medicine or when they build technology, uh, they need to be the best in the world in order to tackle some of the most important uh, challenges that we have. Uh, so finding the most amazing people, creating uh, access to top quality healthcare everywhere, uh, spreading the knowledge, right? Making it available everywhere in every language, right? So, you know, we created this amazing repository, uh, you know, that we built over more than five years with the second to none in scope, in depth, that created by some of the best doctors in the world. How do we uh, translate it? to every single language because we are going to create access to medical information and democratize it in ways that were just impossible and be accessible from any mobile device or web connection to people who don't have access to healthcare. And doing that is very important, but we need to harness and bring with us together and inspire doctors from all over the world because we want to make sure that the quality of the content remains awesome, right? So that's an important thing for us. And as we're moving from a more market-based economy in healthcare in the United States into a lot of government-based healthcare throughout the world, we need to also start talking with government constituencies and explaining to them why we are providing higher quality healthcare, faster access, at a lower cost, which is basically singing their song. I mean, this is what governments are looking for, actually. And building it with technology and with engagement that enables the government to actually provide better care at a lower cost. And I think that working with these constituencies and empowering them to provide health care to, to their people, right, in a better and easier way, on their terms, actually, right, rather than saying, oh, no, we're going to do it our way, we're going to say, let's do it collaboratively, right, figure out what the challenges are, how can we use our technology and our know-how to help you provide better care in a lower cost is the most important thing that we're doing now all over the world. To my next question, which is, uh, you, you've all touched on the working through, and they range from you know technology to regulatory to societal. So getting the doctors on board, people capital. Where do you see the role of meetings like this, where you really have uh, heads of both you know, private uh, corporations as well as uh, public leaders coming together and convening in helping overcome those challenges. And I'll start with you since you were already going that, down that path. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's fantastic. I mean, like, it, it, it's really amazing. I mean, for me, it's just an unbelievable opportunity to meet people from government, from industry, uh, that are really thinking about the bettering of the world, right? So the common denominator here for us is, is really second to none, right? Like meeting these people that are minded to helping their constituencies coming together, solving problems, having these awesome discussions, both in the session, but also in the corridors, right? So I've had amazing discussions here with, uh, with people, just learning what, what is important for them, what are their challenges, how they're looking at healthcare from different perspectives, uh, from different cultures, right? And, and having a real conversation uh, for us as a company is amazing. Wonderful, and Katrina, I'd love to hear from you how, what you sort of hope to achieve over the next few days and, and how this helps. The area of genome editing is perhaps a bit unusual in that even though it is a young field, it has very much both burst on the scene in a much broader way than just new medicines. I mean, it was on the cover of The Economist last week and, and has really become not just a, a topic in the scientific community or the medical community, but much more broadly because of the ethical implications and also because you know, the idea that you could do something that's long been imagined and now is possible, it, it, is a, it is a spectacularly quick change. And so I think a lot of us are grappling with it. And, you know, I live this every day, but absolutely recognize this is something that has much broader implications than just the specific medicines that we are working on. So a meeting like this is a wonderful community to, to talk to people who want to engage in very complex, multidimensional, important, challenges that have great potential but may, maybe bring a lot of questions along with those challenges. You know, we all want to, who doesn't want to help fix genetic diseases? But the technology is not limited to that in how it might be used and so we have to engage a much more greater cross-section of community regulators and, and all of that but also you know, people in ethical bioethicists and people who think about this at a, at a broader economic level all being part of the conversation, this is a wonderful place to engage in a very multi-dimensional way. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I just want to second what everyone's saying. You know, it's a forum like this brings together from the healthcare ecosystem all of the relevant stakeholders in a way that's that's very powerful. I mean, everyone from the regulators to the patent lawyers and, and government payers and, and people in the field of biotech. Um, so when you think about a new, a patient-centered um, paradigm of medicine that everyone seems to want and, and is such a global challenge, you know, every, every individual country is struggling in their own way. Um, to actually have people in the same room who can compare notes and um, learn best practices and, um, you know, in the corridors as well as in the, in the public forums, I think it's very powerful. Um, I think what's also interesting for, for me is that, you know, um, I, you know, just to second what you were saying about how we're really at this moment where we're starting to, to see science fiction become science reality and the, um, the, the sort of Gutenberg moment that we find ourselves at right now where we can, you know, read and write in ways that we never could imagine before to, to, to the human genome. Um, is, is so powerful and you know we, we see ourselves as part of that story you know if you guys um, if the if, if we're at this movable type you know if you guys are, are if that's what CRISPR is you know maybe we in regenerative medicine are the ink because we're actually being able to grow the, okay. the, 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 the at a different scale you know we, we're able to control um, biology in ways we've never imagined before well, we've imagined but never been able to do before um, every relevant scale from the genome to the to the cellular level and then now to the three-dimensional level and I think what's very interesting about this is that sure we're exploring new ideas about the boundaries of the body and the potential for medicine and human health but this has applications in industry way beyond health um, you know if you can think about people that are doing you know in different corners of the world really interesting work with with this paradigm of what can we do if we collaborate with biology and we we think of this of the cell as a factory um, with programming that can be edited um, not just to the human genome but with bacteria what can we do we can start to think about tackling issues in sustainability if we think about um, you know there's a um, a really great biomineralogist based in <laughs> Singapore who's collaborating with bacteria to, to mine valuable minerals from desalination brine, which is a toxic byproduct of the desalination process. You know, you can start to do that, creating um, wealth from waste by collaborating with biology. And so what I would say is that at a meeting like this, we can finally have discussions about how do we tackle issues of sustainability by, by, by beginning to collaborate with biology, you know, after, as we're starting to come up against the limits of what we're able to do with traditional physics and chemistry. I think that's a very powerful conversation, and it's one that's, where, that's much beyond even the, the amazing boundaries that, that health um, provides. I just want to add one, one more uh, small thing that was uh, really amazing for me. Uh, and we're talking about, about discussion and thinking and talking, uh, but I, I would talk also on, a, on the pragmatic dimension of the forum. I think that you know, you're bringing together both innovators, you know, young innovators on the one end that are very excited, doing new things, changing things in a very significant way, but also the implementers, the people that are day in and day out managing large populations. Uh, and are creating, what, taking these ideas, and they need innovators. They are slow to innovate, they're slow to think about the future, but they deal with everyday issues all the time, and they need innovation in order to do things better and faster. And the innovators need the access to the people that actually have the populations. And the fact that you're bringing both of them together, not only for a discussion, and I can tell you from my experience, Health have got a lot of opportunities here to really talk with some of these amazing partners to take some of our innovation and bring it to actual markets today. And that's amazing. So that's not just a conference to talk about things, but actually to get things done. Thank you. And I like that there's this pragmatic aspect of what can we implement right now. And I really second your, your emotion of this being science fiction. <laughs> so uh, could you help us all crystal ball? And I know it's very difficult to do, but Goodness. 10 years <laughs> into the future, mm -hmm. what does healthcare from your lens look like? Not me with you. first. No. Oh, Whoever would like well, to let start. Me, <laughs> let me channel my, my crystal ball. Um, let's see. I, I think quite clearly we're going to be, um, well, in 10 years. 10 years is actually quite a short, a, a short period of time in our field. I, I hate to say it. You, know, if you're, you have to be a marathon runner um, who sprints every day um, for decades, right? So, but let's just you know, put that aside and think, well, 
I think we're going to see um, remarkable changes probably most immediately in oncology. I think this is um, a disease where um, the genetics really have a big impact. Um, the understanding of cancer as a genetic disease is uh, is, put, is being put into practice. And I, um, I think that's where we're gonna see the needle move most quickly because the stakes are so high and the genetics are something that we can begin to understand uh, much more quickly. Um, I think we're also going to start to see re more regenerative therapies like what we're working on. You know, it's been a long road for us. You know, the first therapies were um, first um, approved in the 90s and many people say hey many people assume that our technology is one that they can just get at the doctor already um, and so I hope that this kind of um, there's going to be a bit of merging between um, science fiction and science reality I think um, we're going to start to have more living therapies on the market whether it's um, you know whether it's yogurt that can help us detect colon cancer like Sangeeta Bhatia is working on it's amazing work right um, or if it's going to be things like what we're doing I, I hope that will be approved by 10 years from now and that congenital defects and um, bone resections will be something solvable it, we, we, won't, we won't have to um, treat the human body um, we won't have to pretend that we're, we won't have to interact with it as if we're carpenters, essentially. Um, we're going to be able to extend our healthy lives. Um, and one thing that I really love about our work um, in skeletal reconstruction is I think that it has this after effect of maintain, this a, a beautiful after effect of maintaining our bodies and allowing ourselves to really um, remain active is that we can maintain the health of our minds, which is still, I think, going to remain a mystery even, even 10 years from now. Um, I, I get really excited. I think we're going to start to see um, more merging of scientific disciplines. If I'm going to look into my crystal ball, um, I, 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 see, I see the cosmos, you know? I see the physics of the, um, of the universe, the, the things like quantum physics, things like astrophysics. I think we're going to start to understand more and more how those mechanisms are resident in our own bodies in things like um, DNA mutation um, and many other things I could go on and on. But I think we're going to start to see a, a merging of disciplines, a lot of um, new fields that will have strange sounding hyphenated names. And, and lots of exciting um, new ways to, to maintain our health. Ron, can I get you the crystal ball? Yeah, <laughs> sure. I, I'll, I'll try to confine myself to three things that I think uh, uh, that are very exciting for me, right? Part of uh, a lot of very, very exciting evolution in healthcare and, and poetry uh, <laughs> uh, alongside that I think it's really, really inspiring for us to see some, some of the amazing, amazing things that are happening in science mm -hmm. that will build into what we're doing when we provide healthcare. Uh, you know, on the ground, I think that we're moving from delayed healthcare to immediate healthcare, from a world in which we are used to waiting in waiting rooms for doctors and waiting for days and sometimes weeks to get into specialists and surgeries, to a world in which we get immediate care from any time, anywhere, right? So we push a button, we get in front of a doctor. We push a button, we get in front of the knowledge immediately. We want to get a test done, we want to understand our data, it happens in seconds, right? Rather than days or weeks or months. The second thing that I want to say is that we're moving from uh, reactive to proactive medicine. And that's really exciting. As we're starting to quantify and measure everything, and the data stream are starting to come together and go into the doctors, go into the people that have the knowledge, putting this data together when it's streamlined will allow us to see variability at a time before we actually understand what, what's wrong with us. So today, we go to a doctor, we see care when something's wrong. We're feeling a pain, a discomfort, and now it's time to go to the doctor or to a hospital where something is bleeding. In the future, the machine will see that something is about to go wrong with us because the signs exist in us before we actually feel the pain, before we feel the discomfort. And once all this data is aggregated into a place that they can then interpret it by doctors and say, oh, this sign that is irregular is actually something to worry about, then we will be able to basically send a signal back to the person and say, hey, you should avoid this, you should not do that, well before you get the heart attack or the stroke or the thing that will actually cause you an asthma attack or things that are not as bad as you know, a heart attack. So reactive to proactive. And the second thing from local to global, I think that knowledge exists 
It's just not in the same geography. It's just not at the same time. And our ability to access the best knowledge that exists somewhere in the world and equalize the ground, democratize access to top quality health, will be available to all. So between uh, delayed to immediate, uh, reactive to proactive, and local to global, we'll see a different healthcare and better healthcare to everyone. Thank you. And Katrine, if you could uh, go lucky last. Sure. So I, I do live most of my most of my world in the the very focused world of creating new medicines, and so it's it's fascinating to hear you guys talk about all these grand connections. And and you know, I I really live in the world of making new medicines. Um, I I think that the the point that I would focus on the most is genomic medicine becoming a reality in mm -hmm. this time scale. Um, as Nina mentioned, 10 years in the world of making new medicines. I hope to have one product on the market mm -hmm. in that time frame. Mm -hmm. Let's be realistic. That would be a fast, wonderful yeah. accomplishment to not only translate this new science that we're working on, but to turn it into an actual medicine that is available to actual patients. My aspiration is to do a lot more than that, but if I look at how difficult it is to make new medicines, that I, I want at least to be able to do that. And I know that all the scientists back at, at Editas and the others in the industry and in this field think the same way. But I think that the, the bigger canvas in which this is happening is genomic medicine becoming a reality. You know, as a society, over 15 years ago, we made the investment in the Human Genome Project. And I think a lot of folks may say, well, what came of that? It, it, it underlies everything we do now because we can look at a genome rapidly, cheaply, and accurately. You know, it costs, what, a billion and more dollars to do the first genome, and now it costs less than $1,000, and it's faster, and it's more accurate than the first one. What does that mean? It means that physicians can now begin to think differently about how that information informs their understanding of a patient's health, understanding of how their genetics might inform their health status. Genetics isn't everything. It's one really important factor. It's not the only factor that drives your health. But being able to have that incorporated as a one of the starting points, uh, the genetic information being one of the starting points for a physician, I think will really shift how medicine is practiced. And you do see this, you mentioned in cancer, you know, there are television advertisements in the U.S. about cancer treatment centers who, who say, we sequence your genome as our starting point. Oh, that's consumer-directed advertising already talking about mm -hmm. genetics driving therapeutic choice. Cancer is probably at the forefront front of that connection, but you do see it starting to impact all the other therapeutic areas. And I think if you have medical students starting to think that way, the next generation of physicians are going to approach their concept of disease differently than prior generations. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, Ron, you, you spoke about immediate medicine. Um, we have a bit of a waiting room here as well because we're running over time. But um, before I, I open the floor for questions, uh, we, ask, uh, we ask our audience uh, on social media for questions. And, and we always have uh, quite a young audience on, on the live stream, uh, especially. And, and somebody wrote to us, uh, a Chinese, uh, Chinese young man wrote to us and said, look, I, I, I checked out the websites of the three companies and I'm fascinated. Now tell me, what should I learn? What are the skills I need to work of one of these companies and what should I study because it's so much more than, than, than medicine. Uh, so maybe you can give us like your, your one sentence answer of, of, uh, of what should a person study to be hired by you. From my perspective, it would be study what you're passionate about. I mean, the number of different technical disciplines required to ultimately bring a new medicine to a approval. It, it's, it's legion, it's everything from biochemistry to molecular biology to cellular biology to material science to clinicians to people who come from the regulatory perspective. I mean, I could make a very long list. Um, and if you study what you're passionate about, there are many, many different ways that you could become part of a company like this. What I do know is everybody that I work with, and, and the number one reason that I'm there is the people that are there are fantastic and being able to work on this mission with them is the only way you can face these really, really, really hard challenges. Yeah, I would, I would second that. I would say, you know, look within and, and see what you're most passionate about and, and, if, and triangulate between that passion and the mission of, of the company. And there, uh, uh, there are so many ways to interact with this technology. Um, 
you know, that said, I think another thing that um, oftentimes people aren't aware of is that the barriers to learning about um, cells and genetics is coming down so much, especially in the United States. There's a movement of, of citizen scientists, you know, essentially, you know, hundreds of years ago, you didn't have to go get a PhD before you were allowed to experiment. You know, you had um, Galvani on his rooftop with frog legs, you know, studying lightning, right? And, and, and at some point, you know, as, we, as the knowledge that we've gleaned has become more and more complex, we've created disciplines um, and, and people have become in, in some ways disconnected from each other. And, and one thing that I find very interesting is that there are new ways for people with no training to be able to contribute to cancer research, for example. There's a website called Zooniverse where you can log on and help analyze images, real images from real scientists and, and help them look for, um, for help with cancer detection. There are games that you can play online like Fold It that can help you um, contribute to science um, without any training. Um, and there are community-based biolabs that are popping up all over the world where anyone from artists and architects can learn the techniques of um, genetic engineering for the purposes of, of exploration, you know, learning scientific methods without being beholden to the scientific process of generating hypotheses and testing them. And so we're starting to see a beautiful proliferation of work um, from bio artists and, and architects and um, all kinds of people who you wouldn't think would be um, necessarily experimenting with biology. And so I would say, you know, there are so many ways to connect with um, the interesting work that's happening in the world right now. And, um, you know, just, just find, find whatever meets your passion and, and go with that. Thank you. Ron? So it's a combination of two things. Uh, one of them is, and I'll second and third what you, you guys <laughs> just said now, uh, you know, healthcare is a very mission-based practice, right? So learning the human condition and falling in love with helping people is fundamental to everything, right? So we, we hire people at health time. It doesn't matter how skilled and smart they are. If they're not mission-driven, mm. we don't hire them, right? So uh, we want the intersection between smarts, capabilities, and being mission-driven and wanting to help people, right? So learning the human condition, understanding what's going on around the world, especially for people that are more privileged, uh, to understand what people really need you know, all over the world and how we can help them is the foundation. Uh, when you have that, I think that the second thing that is extremely important, and I would recommend, especially to people that are building their careers right now, uh, to do go and do a lot of math, right? So <laughs> yes, data, statistics, engineering are all the future. We're gonna see a lot of data coming together from a lot of sources. D data is the new oil, right? It's a lot of opportunities in da analyzing data understanding data, improving people's lives using data, from going from reactive medicine to proactive medicine, to genomics, to other areas. If you have deep knowledge of data and math and you know how to analyze it, you're gonna create magic in the future. So investing in math, investing in data, investing in knowledge of analyzing and working with data is very, very important and will create a skill for you to participate either in really work in data directly or just in engineering disciplines that require the same infrastructure. So I would highly recommend that. Thank you very much. All right, uh, can I see a show of hands on the floor if there are any questions? We have a microphone. If not, and mindful of the, of the full schedule of everybody, well, thank you, Fulvia, for bringing this wonderful uh, representatives of the technology pioneers uh, here to the panel. And thank you all, uh, panelists. Do as the Chinese student has done. Go to the website of uh, Editor's Medicine, of Epibone, and of HealthTap. Um, find more information about the companies. And uh, you can re-watch uh, this press conference on our website and soon on YouTube. Uh, uh, so, and, and share it, of course. Our hashtag is uh, hashtag AMNC15. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.